Hello and welcome to our special coverage of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, live on Channel's television. I'm Ladi Akri Dunwali. The headlines. United Nations reports gross violations in Mariupol. Russia says reports it is taking stolen grain from Syria are fake. And U.S. President, in rare interview, says Americans are really, really down. Again, this morning with the United Nations human rights officials saying that at least 1,348 people have been killed in Mariupol since the start of the Russian invasion, making it the deadliest place in Ukraine. Michelle Bachelet, addressing the UN Human Rights Council in Geneva, said the death toll is likely to be thousands higher. She also said nine of ten residential buildings and six of ten private houses have been damaged or destroyed, citing the attack on the theater in Mar as an emblematic example. Ms. Bachelet raised concern over the filtration process in the city, where arbitrary determinations, intimidation and humiliation, which may amount to ill treatment, have been reported. Between February and the end of April, Mariupol was likely the deadliest place in Ukraine. The intensity and extent of hostilities, destruction and death and injury strongly suggest that serious violations of international humanitarian law and gross violations of international human rights law have occurred. To date, OSCHR has verified 1,348 individual civilian deaths directly in hostilities in Mariupol, including 70 children. These deaths were caused by airstrikes, tank and artillery shelling, and small arms and light weapons during street fighting. Sorry, street fighting. The actual death toll of hostilities on civilians is likely thousands higher. Bodies have been found in improvised individual or collective graves in yards, streets, and parks, in unattended houses and apartments. Many are still to be buried. We assess that up to 90% of residential buildings have been damaged or destroyed, as well as up to 60% of private houses. An estimated 350,000 people were forced to leave the city. The humanitarian situation is devastating, with civilians continuing to bear the brunt of this conflict. A Russian air attack on the Mariupol Drama Theater on 16 of March stands out among the very deadliest and most emblematic example of the harm caused to civilians. The theater had hundreds of civilians hiding inside, with signs clearly marked children visible from the sky. People cannot leave and return to the city freely, including those who left Mariupol in April or March. I'm also concerned about the way the so-called filtration process of civilians was and is being carried out, but reportedly involving arbitrary terminations, intimidation and humiliation, which may amount to ill treatment, as well as reported instances of family separation and threats to the right to private life. The related risk of detentions and ill treatment for those who do not pass the process are also of concern. Je donne la parole à Luxembourg. While Ukraine's defense officials have argued that they will be fighting until total victory is secured against Russia, high-ranking White House officials have argued that the conflict in Ukraine has to have a diplomatic solution. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan says the United States will continue to help Ukraine to the maximum extent possible, first on the battlefield and then ultimately at the negotiating table. He adds that the United States thinks the war in Ukraine has to end with diplomacy. Mr. Sullivan was speaking at the Center for New American Security, a Washington, D.C.-based lobby group close to the Democratic Party. And Moscow's representative to Syria has labeled as fake reports that Russian flagged ships had been seen taking Ukraine's grain to ports in Syria. That's according to the state news agency. Reuters had earlier reported on satellite images from Magza Technologies showing that Russia had been transporting Ukraine's grain that was harvested last season to Syria over the last couple of months. 
quote, this is more fake, unconfirmed, and unrealistic information, RIA quotes Alexander Laurentiev is saying. The main reserves are located in the Nikolaev and Odessa regions. Russian ships do not have access to these ports because they are under uh, the control of Ukraine. And in a rare interview, President Joe Biden of the United States has said that Americans are really, really down as they grapple with soaring inflation after two years of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, exacerbated by the war in Ukraine. He told the Associated Press of the need for mental health in America has skyrocketed. Mr. Biden said he wanted Americans to be, quote, confident because he was confident. The president's popularity has plunged as uh, November elections loom that will decide which party controls Congress. And President uh, Vladimir uh, Zelensky, uh, uh, let, let me uh, skip that. We'll come back to that in just a moment. President Vladimir Zelensky has won backing from the leaders of France, Germany, Italy, and Romania to give Ukraine European Union candidate status while urging them to send more weapons and impose tougher sanctions on Russia. Ukraine has urged the EU to clear a path to its membership, but such a move has caused some misgivings in the 27-member bloc. The meeting came a day before the European Commission is due to make a recommendation on Ukraine's status as an EU candidate. Olaf Scholz said Germany would support Ukraine's path to EU membership, but also said requirements in democracy and rule of law would need to be complied with. Mr. Scholz said the clear message of the EU visit was that, quote, Ukraine belongs to the European family, adding that it was high time a decision on the Western Balkans was also reached. Italian Prime Minister Mario Draghi uh, ha, says the main message of his talks in Kiev with Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky uh, and the leaders of France and Germany was that Italy wants to see Ukraine as part of the European Union. Speaking at a joint news conference in the Ukrainian capital, Mr. Draghi said he fully supported investigations into alleged war crimes in Ukraine. He said Italy wanted atrocities to stop and called for peace, but that any diplomatic solution cannot be separated from the will of Kiev. However, the EU holds a summit uh, next week on these matters. And French President Emmanuel Macron says uh, that the three other European uh, leaders who went with him on a visit could count on its allies uh, for support in Ukraine joining the EU. The leaders of Germany, France, and Italy, all criticized in the past by Kiev for support viewed as too cautious, offered the hope of EU membership to a country pleading for weapons to fend off Russia's invasion. Mr. Macron said he and uh, the European counterparts, Olaf Scholz, Mario Draghi, and Romania's Klaus Iohannis, had agreed on some actions to show Ukraine is part of the European family. He also said some sort of a communication channel was needed with Russian President Vladimir Putin, whose forces have invaded Ukraine, but that none of the European powers sought to negotiate on behalf of Ukraine's leaders. U.S. Agricultural Secretary Tom Vilsack says temporary silos on Ukraine's borders would be intended to prevent Russia from stealing Ukrainian grain and making sure the country's winter harvest is not low due to a lack of storage. But during a visit to the United Nations, Mr. Vilsack stressed that reviving shipments from Ukraine's Black Sea ports was the most effective and efficient way to export grain and urged Russia to take UN-led talks on the issue seriously. The U.S. president had said that temporary silos would be built along the border with Ukraine in a bid to help export more grain and address a growing global food crisis. Immediately to open up those ports. Uh, the Turkish uh, representatives to these negotiations, I think, is, is uh, certainly proceeding uh, with the level of seriousness that is necessary. Um, you know, I, I, I would just simply hope that the Russians take this thing as seriously and that they're not uh, just doing this uh, to create uh, an image. Uh, this is serious things. We shouldn't be using food as a weapon. They should be acting immediately to open up those ports, uh, and they should end this war. The, the failure uh, of Russia uh, to allow and to enable uh, the port to be open and available um, is obviously causing some significant disruption. Uh, to the extent that that grain, nearly 20 million metric tons, can't get into the market 
it again not only creates a potential shortages in countries in North Africa and the Middle East uh, that can least afford to have food shortages at this point in time, creates the, the risk of additional unrest and instability in those countries, but it also uh, creates, again, the uh, opportunity for those who speculate about the value of uh, grains and oils to be able to speculate on the high side, which ultimately results in higher food prices across the board. Uh, so I would certainly hope uh, and would encourage Russia to, to, to be, uh, uh, to, to, you know, first and foremost, to end this war, and secondly, in the alternative, to make sure that they are negotiating in good faith about the reopening of the port and that they do so quickly, because the need is, uh, the need is, is, is immediate. China's foreign ministry says strategic cooperation between China and Russia does not target any third country, just after the leaders of both countries agreed to expand cooperation. Chinese President Xi Jinping told Mr. Putin during a phone call on Wednesday that China and Russia were willing to continue to support each other on issues involving core interests and major concerns such as sovereignty and security. The two also agreed to expand cooperation in energy, finance and industry. On the Ukraine issue, Foreign Ministry spokesperson Wang Wenbin reiterated that China advocates the peaceful settlement of disputes and supports diplomatic efforts to end the conflict. China has refused to condemn uh, Russia's actions in Ukraine or call them an invasion and has urged a uh, negotiated uh, settlement. European Commission spokespersons have said that Europe's energy security is not at immediate risk as a result of Russia's reducing gas supplies to more European countries. The spokesperson says, based on our exchange with national authorities this morning via the Gas Coordination Group, there is no indication of an immediate security of supply risk, adding that Brussels and countries' national authorities were monitoring the situation closely. And in a barren uh, sun-baked landscape at Greece's Megalopolis open pit mine, a bucket wheel excavator scrubs out lignite and sends it 10 kilometers by conveyor belts to a storage yard where it will wait no more than two months before being used. In Megalopolis, on the southern Peninopolis Peninsula, one of the country's two coal hotlands, um, Greece has wound down the extraction of lignite, or brown coal, since 2010, as Europe shifts away from fossil fuels to renewables. But Russia's decision to cut off gas to a number of European countries over their refusal to accept Moscow's rubles for gas payment scheme has scoped concerns over security and soaring costs of gas supplies. This has prompted the Greek government to push back plans to retire some coal-fired plants and announced that coal mining will be ramped up by 50% this and next year, ahead of the country's peak summer tourist season when power demand for cooling rises. We'll be taking a break short, uh, at this point, and uh, when uh, we return, We'll be speaking to an analyst on what we are doing uh, in terms of energy security risk worldwide and how that could have impact on inflation. Please stay on with us. Welcome back and thanks for staying tuned. Let's uh, take a look at some of the stories and how they are panning out in terms of impact. Joining me, as always at this time, is Ine John Mekwava Business this morning. Good Ine. morning. And do I say it's TGIF? <laughs> Uh, yes, but maybe is. not TGIF for quite a lot of people. Not uh, uh, not for a whole lot of people. Let's start off with, uh, I mean, uh, the global stocks. Um, it, it, it's like there was a synergy in the bears uh, uh, yesterday <laughs> and up till this morning. Virtually every important stock market has Yes, fallen. yes. That, that's been the trend for a couple of weeks now. Uh, it's just been pockets of uh, bullish sentiment in some markets, uh, like Nigeria escaped it for a little bit, but we've also caught up. That uh, sentiment has spread to Nigeria now for, I think, uh, for some days now. And... Uh, and it's all because of the interest rates. We know that uh, 
the world is trying to fight inflation. And one way they're trying to do that is by raising rates. And once they raise rates, uh, there's the threat of recession. And so investors are afraid that uh, stocks will lose prices even more. And then they might even lose their principal that they invested. So a lot of there's a lot of uh, a sell-off. They just want to get out of the market. I don't know where they're putting the money at this time, but I mean, there's a lot of sell-off. Stocks are just going down from the United United States, and I think it got worse when the U.S. Uh, raised their rates. That, that was what I was going to say. That <laughs> yes. by the sharpest amount since yes, 1994. Yes, Yes, yes. So I mean, uh, investors, it's just so much uncertainty everywhere. There's no hedge anywhere. Maybe in oil, that's where it is, but it's not that easy to get into the oil market at this time because prices are already high Very up high. there, you know. But uh, the market everywhere, from Asia to uh, U.S., Europe. Nigeria, everywhere, we're seeing a lot of sell-off in, in global stocks. Investors are jittery, and uh, they don't know where the next blow or how deep the next blow is going to be. So they just want to get out of the market and uh, stay aloof and watch. Talking about pockets, uh, one country that seems to have gone the other way, I remember the other day, we were talking about Russia uh, uh, headed the other direction yes. while everybody was headed. Yes. But it appears Japan has followed Russia. Yeah, well, well, um, you know, they have their own um, perspective to all of this. So while inflation is high everywhere and then central bankers are trying to deal with inflation by raising rates, they have this policy of um, uh, uh, having almost zero interest rates. Right. So that means if you borrow money in Japan, at the moment it's minus 0 0.1. And for government bonds, they're looking at zero. So you don't, almost not paying anything. So why they are doing that actually is because what it does, it, it, it makes their yen drop. So yen is at the lowest now. And then, of course, one thing is once um, um, the U.S. increases rates, dollar goes up. Dollar goes up every, you know, it's just like Bitcoin and the other cryptocurrency. Once dollar goes up, every other currency goes down. Their value goes down. But the yen has received a lot of dip. But one advantage of that for them is that then exports becomes cheaper, you know, for people outside. So most people will want to buy their exports. So that means their exports will go up even though their uh, currency's value is depreciating because compared to the world, then because once there's interest rate hike, you know, people who dress us want to go there and all that. For them, I think their focus is actually that let their exports increase because then their currency is lower. That means you can buy more Japanese commodities compared to, for instance, the UN, United States. So you might want to patronize them, and that is their own focus for now. But we don't know how long... Uh, they yeah, keep doing that. Yeah, because that also has its own consequences. If your currency just keeps going down, eventually you're going to feel the pinch in your in your economy. Absolutely. You know, and you can't be the, the loner in the whole world when everybody has their interest rate. Nigeria tried it, and then we saw that... We it, saw what, 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 what the impact of that Exactly, was. and that's why we had we saw the MPC raising rates at the last uh, meeting. Indeed. Mm. Uh, uh, you had mentioned this uh, a little bit earlier on, uh, I think that was possibly at the start of this week, uh, when you mentioned that the uh, 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 Russian aircraft deal, the <laughs> purchase, and uh, now more details of it are coming out. Uh, yes. They're ready to deliver more than a thousand domestically <laughs> made airplanes you to know, the country's airlines. You know, we've been talking about uh, the ingenuity of the Russian right. central bank and running the people who are actually running the economy. So. Um, some days ago, uh, when um, Kayade was on, we talked about Lander Grata. Remember the, the Lander, the vehicle, right. you know? So they've, uh, they, are, they have succeeded in manufacturing Lander, and they call it Lander Grata. In fact, they call it anti sanction vehicle. <laughs> <laughs> so that's for the vehicle. But it does have its, it has its own um, weaknesses. I think it has problem with seat belt, brakes, um, airbag, you know, some safety measures because Everything there is in Russia. They got it from Russia and probably a bit from China and their friendly countries, you know. So they have that lander grata that will at least save them uh, when it comes to vehicles. Yeah. Now they're working on the aviation. But this is, I don't know, uh, because 
we do know that uh, it's very difficult for the one country is to stand. A it is, thing. and the safety. I mean, for for the vehicle, you can. I saw the picture of some of those landed grata, not looking very comfortable. You know, you can still manage. It's on the road, but when you're talking about aviation airplanes that are going to be in the air, there's so many things involved, Absolutely. and then to see in the number of years you're able to manufacture parts that's used to be imported from the western uh, from some of the west uh, countries and these are things that take a lot of scientific study you know even though well no new knowledge uh, as such exactly maybe still still intelligence here and there but i mean we'll wait and see but russians are very determined uh, 1000 aircraft uh, in the next couple even of on, years even under normal circumstances that would be an ambitious target very very ambitious and we do worry for the safety because even for the lander grata, I mean, apart from the du durability, which right. some taxi drivers have complained about, right. uh, they are also talking of the safety. You know, and that's on the ground. And that's on the ground. And now you're talking of in the air with hundreds of people. Uh, it's it's quite a risk, but we do know that uh, Russia... the Russians have proved uh, people wrong many times in the mm -hmm. past. So maybe let's this hope going this to be, be another... one of those. Exactly. Uh, speaking of ingenuity, the Bank of Russia. Mm -hmm. Uh, says it is ready to accept cryptocurrency payments. Mm, uh, only for international trade. Now, the, I mean, we talk about democracy everywhere. And, uh, you know, one of, one of the advantages or one of the, the benefits or the motivation for cryptocurrency is the fact that it's decentralized. So you do your transactions. You're not watched. You're not controlled. No central bank is looking at you. So uh, a couple of days ago, they started, uh, they added some drafts into their law, the finance law, that should ban the, in the transaction of cryptocurrency in the country, in Russia. Meanwhile, the country is looking to use the same cryptocurrency for international trades to avoid sanctions. You know, so they are saying that if you're a resident of Russia, you know, you're not allowed to do it. It's illegal. But for the government, uh, they want to use cryptocurrency for trades, you know, and all of that. And, you know, it, it, it's just... <laughs> are, they, are they going into this at the, possibly the wrong time? Because uh, uh, you and I discussed earlier on, and I know that I've seen this all over the news, uh, 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 and I just hope it hasn't created some panic attacks or heart attacks. For, because when you hear that, oh, uh, uh, Bitcoin, for example, was $69,000 <laughs> at some point this at year. At some point. And, and now you're talking about $20,000. 20, yeah. $20, yes. That's about... 35% or 40% mm -hmm. of what it was. Mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of people went into it at that time. So, <laughs> uh, again, given that, you know, is, is, do you think that perhaps the, uh, the Bank of Russia is going into this strategically? Well, um, I, I believe that for every action or decision, there is a focus, there right. is a perspective, there is an objective. At this time, if they go into it, they're looking at how to avoid the sanctions and still carry out um, their international trades. And we do know that they've created a lot of ways now. You, there's the rupee, robo, there's the uh, one and all of that. And this will just be an additional uh, uh, way. And of course, they do know that just as we talked about the global stocks being down. The crypto market has not been immune to what's going on in the world at this time. So I, I guess if they want to go into it at this time, they would count their costs and put in some protecting sanctions, you know, protecting policies that will guide the trade and then uh, help them. And then who knows, it might bring some good to the crypto market because if we see um, countries trading through crypto on the, on the platform, it might yeah. actually, you know, increase volume and supply and demand, and it might also bring a little bit of uh, maybe sunlight to that space. Just maybe. Just maybe. Just uh, maybe. We'll, 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 we'll keep watching that. Before before I let you go, in here, I must ask about Revlon. When I saw the story, <laughs> I, I had to read it twice, uh, <laughs> that Revlon declares bankruptcy. I want, yeah. One would have thought that there were some... Uh, Products <laughs> and companies that are that were immune. I mean, women <laughs> like you, of course, have to make up. Because we always have to look good, good and, and all and that. All you know, that. But Revlon is declaring bankruptcy. So yeah. one, one is wondering, mm. you know, so nobody really has escaped. Yeah, but all of well, this. the thing with Revlon is, 
I, I think they've had this coming in a bit, in a while, because Revlon, as, as you have mentioned, is uh, it's an it's a, an old company. It's been, they've right. been there for a while, but they seem to have a weakness of not uh, changing with the times. So um, these days, you 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 call Revlon because you depend or you you believe in their integrity. Their brand has been there in a while. Their quality and Absolutely. all of that. But there are so many brands that have come after that and they've used the social media. A lot of people are now doing online shopping and all of that, but they have hardly embraced the new ways of doing things. So you see, uh, the shock of the war and um, inflation and all of that just pushed them a little bit off the edge because they have not positioned themselves even before now, you know, to get the new opportunities. So people, you use them, use them because of the mind that they've been there for a while, they are dependable, they are good, but they are new markets and their new competition, which they have not bought into, they have not pushed into, because they've not embraced, for instance, social media. I mean, I know I've spoken to Juliana a, a lot of times, where you have, even, especially in the midst of the pandemic, right. a lot of companies actually closed their physical shop and went virtual. And that is where most of the market is. You know, and Revlon has just uh, not really embraced that, which is one of the reasons why it's kind of easy for them to get caught up in the mist because we still look good we still buy beauty beauty <laughs> beauty, product. beauty products yeah. yes <laughs> but there's all of this of course behind it that, yes you know. exactly so that's 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 where the foundation of the pressure is for them and that's why at this time uh being battered over the years and low sales and uh, not grabbing some of the new markets that's been available it's easy for them to get uh, tipped over at this time Indeed. Um, Ine, thank you for the perspective. There'll be more of this, of course, as we usually say uh, every day, uh, right after this program. And then later on, on Business Incorporated, you can join Ine and uh, Laddie Williams of our business desk for all of that. And uh, we, we, we'll still stay with this general theme. Let's talk now to uh, Dr. Uh, Boniface Chizia, uh, Chief Executive Officer of BIC Consultancy. Uh, he's an economic and development consultant. He joins us virtually. Good morning to you, Dr. Chizia. Thank you for your time. Laddie, how are you doing? I'm fine, thank you. It's nice to see and hear from you once uh, again. Yes, yes, indeed. It's, it's been quite uh, some time. Yes. Quite some time, indeed. Well, uh, yes, yes. Let, 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 me get, let me dive right into it. Uh, I was just discussing with uh, Ini, um, and uh, we, we talked about the inflationary pressures and the fact that quite a lot of people, you know, uh, companies, corporates, and so on, are really, really feeling the, the unintended, shall we say, consequences of what's going on uh, uh, in uh, Ukraine. And then for countries like Nigeria, which already had uh, structural difficulties to start off with, uh, this situation has just made the situation uh, uh, worse. Uh, what, what's your reading, uh, given our own economic challenges and what this war in uh, Ukraine and the inflation it has brought has, uh, uh, has put us in? Well, you know, I think that uh, it's unfortunate that this war has gone on and has been allowed to go on for this uh, long. It's unfortunate. I think that uh, uh, the world leaders, interested parties, the better step into the United Nations and so on, to see to need this in the world. I think it's gone on for too long. Nobody expected that it would go on for this long. And it's not good for anybody. And then, of course, we risk the fact that this might uh, get out of control. And, and, and of course, it's been speculated that already we have a, a third uh, world war is, is in our hands. You know, talking about inflation, you know, uh, when we had the pandemic, that was the onset. That was exactly what uh, was the onset of inflation, because in the sense that... Uh, you know, most economies, there was no productivity. There was no production whatsoever. And, and when we started getting out of, uh, out of uh, a recession in, in, most, in most economies, and then there was a need to get kickstart the economy. And so you, you discover that uh, there are lots of funds were being injected into um, all the economies around the world. And so that was the onset of inflation. And then, of course, for this uh, to not, not happen, this is an unfortunate development, you know, this was between uh, Russia and Ukraine, you know, that has affected drastically supply chains. You know, so uh, you find that uh, 
uh, supplies of grains and, and gas, oil, and so on, is being affected, and to other extent. So once simple, uh, inflation is uh, supply and demand, and so for the extent that supply is not there, and then you are now having the uh, demand pressure, uh, the price has only one way to go, and that's exactly what you are experiencing. And I think that uh, how are we going to get out of this? I think it's, uh, we have to think through this. I think that uh, uh, my, my take is that the first thing we, we needed to do would be to see if we can get, stop this war, because it's not good for anybody. Uh, and uh, it could snowball, it could get out of hand. And so there's a need for us to uh, pull the brakes. And I don't know why Russia and Ukraine are not talking now, but they should be talking. They started talking at some point in time, but now they don't seem to be talking. And you, Ukraine cannot. I think that's a, uh, we were quite uh, impressed with the fact that uh, Ukraine, in fact, took on the mighty Russia and then uh, proved Russia right. I mean, Russia thought they would just go in there and they run, run over Ukraine. They've not done that, so they've done quite well. But, but Ukraine is not a match to Russia and will never be a match to Russia. And so what we needed to do is that there might be the need for some concessions to be given at this point in time. And that should be the way forward. Uh, but they're trying to... Um, uh, send money to Ukraine and so on and so forth. Uh, to Biden just said it's going to send one billion dollars equipment and so on. Besides other things, it's going to send. Now that's money being money being spent. For Americans, it's inflationary. So, you, you, so money is being pumped into Ukraine that does not add uh, any productivity to the, um, the American economy. And, and no wonder the rate of inflation in, in America has it's been the highest of almost 30, so many years now. And so, so that's that's the problem. So how do we get out of it? We need to get the war stopped. If we don't stop the war, then we'll have some we'll have some difficulties. But of course, in Nigeria, you know, we've uh, <laughs> we've been in downhill for quite some time. You know, so what's our inflation is the fact that uh, you start from it, uh, it's a it's a demand uh, a demand demand pool. You know, you find that uh, you uh, you change rate uh, in Nigeria. You know, so when I I see the Monetary Policy Committee you know, thinking with interest rates, I say, well. As a, as, an, as, an, as a body, uh, that's the only instrument they have to think of with. But I think that what causes inflation in Nigeria, to a large extent, is rate of exchange. Uh, if you have a situation where rate of exchange has gone from about under 200 to 400 and something, and, and that's official window. And, and most people, given, given the scarcity of supply, most, most economic agents, most players within the economy, sold their money from the prior market. And within the prior market, you're talking of 600 and, and you know, the, the, the demand for a dollar, we are so exposed to the external sector, the demand for dollar is insatiable. And so it, it's just going on, and people, people have to import. And so to the extent that you import, uh, they want to pass on this. And so it depends on the uh, demand uh, price elasticities, to the extent that um, uh, uh, consumers can bear the, uh, the price hike. That's the reason there's no put control on them. So I think that you have issues everywhere. When you, you look at Nigeria, you look at... Uh, um, uh, uh, so, uh, Diesel, supply of diesel. It is a terrible situation. I mean, I, I left my house yesterday looking for diesel all over the place. You, don't even, you can't even find it. And then that's you find it. it and that's price. apart from the fact that the price has gone uh, uh, almost beyond double the, the price in only to, to a, the a roof. little time. Yeah. Yes. Yes. But let, so, let, so let's, let, let, me, let, me, let me zero this down a, a little bit because you mentioned something which I thought was, was quite striking when you said, Look, in the case of Nigeria, we were already in the doldrums. But if we, if, if we were in the doldrums, uh, we were told that we were just coming out of recession. And maybe for Nigeria, this, uh, this war in Ukraine was double trouble because we are not, uh, not self-sufficient in food. Uh, and, and a lot of the things that we import, the, the, particularly the grains, come from both Russia and Ukraine, uh, plus fertilizer, a number of other things which we now don't have access to or our access is limited. So we felt that in bread and all the other things that come with grains and all that. We felt that almost immediately in terms of the rise in prices. But you also mentioned the issue of foreign exchange, which makes our own situation slightly different from the situation in all the other places where they were raising interest rates. Um, so if that is, if our own situation is made worse by foreign exchange, you were, one would want to know then what should we be doing? Because it doesn't look as if this war is going to end today or tomorrow or next week. Uh, what, what, what should we be doing to mitigate its impact? Already, the World Bank is saying about 40 or 40-something 40 million more Nigerians 
would get below the poverty line if this current economic parameters are allowed to continue for a couple of more months? Well, I think that a lot of, you know, mitigation factors are yeah, difficult to see in the horizon. You know, what we've not even talked about is the, the fact of the, uh, the insurrection in, in, in the country. Uh, the fact that, you know, people cannot go to their farms. Nobody's able to go to their farms. So you go to the uh, good basket uh, regions of uh, Nigeria, um, they, they're not producing. And so to the extent they're not producing, it means that the supply, supply chains are going, uh, have been disrupted and they wouldn't have a supply uh, problem. So putting inflation is still going to be there. But then what, the, what then do we do uh, as a nation? I think that uh, we don't have the choice. I, I see that uh, we are we'll, uh, we over leverage uh, the uh, uh, authorities that we borrowed to the hills and so on and so forth. And we've pumped most of these things, you know, put so much um, liquidity into the system. But then uh, the, what we have to do is to begin to correct things. I would expect, I was thinking that uh, the refinery would, uh, would come on stream. It seems as if it's like a moving uh, uh, target in terms of uh, when it's going to come on stream. I think that we needed to have that refinery come on, on stream. I was I listened to the news at that time. We are talking about uh, the fertilizer and um, uh, the, the returns we were already beginning to get from the fertilizer. I think that uh, I don't would say that we would, um, would come to our aid if this whatever obstacles is delaying the commencement of operation of the refinery so that if you can remove the importation of petroleum from the problems we have in this economy, and then half of our problem will be solved. We spend more than 30% of foreign exchange in important uh, refined uh, Particular products. So when you have that situation, and then you look at the system, and you look at the fact that we're overly exposed, uh, everybody wants to import. So what you need to do was have productivity. And so uh, a central bank is doing its best. You know, they're trying to uh, reflect the economy. People are criticizing them. They're saying that uh, they're, they're, they're deviating you know, from their core, core mandate. But part of the mandate of central bank is, you know, to, uh, to do development banking. It's there you know, in, in their key duties and responsibilities. And so if that's part of their comment, commandment, so they, they, that's why I find that they're pumping money, you know, for and, uh, the assets are, you know, the common stream and so on, they're putting money in agriculture, you know, um, and putting money in aviation, electricity, and so on and so forth. We need to do that. And, and for us also, we need to get the infrastructure going. So you will take power supply. Uh, I don't know why we can't we can find a headway in trying to solve in a power, a power situation uh, a problem, which we have. It seems to be so recalcitrant. So we have power supply. Nobody is able to, you know, uh, if you are some, some places, you know, uh, they've not had power supply for a very long time. And to, to provide alternative sources of supply, the think of those who are in, in, in manufacturing today, the cost of producing what it means, if you have to get this, you can't even find it. Now, those of us at home, we will try and balance and manage. We use inverter, we use more, we use petrol generator, and so on and so forth to try and mitigate, you know, the effect of uh, lack of diesel. But some oppressors don't have a choice. Now, supposing you're running a hotel, you're running a hotel, and your guests are staying in a hotel, and are you going to tell them we don't have diesel and they're going to stay in the heat? And so it's a terrible situation, you know. So uh, if you look across board, and this is why we need to make sure that. Uh, Election 2023, we better get our acts together. We need to make sure we get people on board uh, who understand the economy. It's very important. You know, I think that lack of uh, appreciation of the economy is, is part of the problem. It's okay to say you are a leader, but if you're a leader, you don't have, uh, you, don't, you don't have appreciate what, what is going on. And then you are being directed, even when they're being misdirected, you don't even know that you are being sent on an, towards a planned ally. So I think that uh, we need to make sure that uh, uh, we do those things. But I think that also is a crisis situation. And that's why I think that uh, uh, we need to, uh, I think that election 2023 is very important. And uh, uh, the turn so far, uh, we are hopeful. We hope that uh, what we are seeing now would do some to become reality. Indeed, indeed. Uh, Dr. Chizia, thank you uh, so much for your perspective this morning. Thank you for your time. It's, uh, it was nice you, to see you again. Thank you, thank you very thank much. You. Yes. Thank you, Lady. Long time. Thank you very much. Thank you. After the break, Polish NBA veteran organizes basketball game to raise funds for Ukraine. Please join us again. Thanks for staying tuned. Uh, let's take a look at some of the sports stories emanating from the situation uh, arising from the war in Ukraine. The Ukrainian Judo Federation has said it will refuse to participate in any international Judo Federation event where Russian and Belarusian athletes are permitted to compete as neutrals amidst plans for such a move at the Grand Slam later this month. 
despite the International Olympic Committee recommending that athletes and officials from both countries are banned from international competitions, the International Judo Federation has stopped short of implementing this measure, instead banning the Russian and Belarusian flags instead. The Russian Judo Federation announced in March that it would withdraw from international competitions because of safety concerns and travel difficulties, a move followed by the Belarusian Judo Federation. However, the athletes are set to make a controversial return on the neutral flag at the Grand Slam in Mongolia's capital, scheduled for June the 24th to the 26th. The European Fencing Championships are set to return in Antalya, Turkey, with Belarus and powerhouses of Russia owing to their ongoing exile from competitions. Russian athletes competing under the neutral Russian Olympic Committee banner topped the fencing medals table at Tokyo 2020 with three gold medals. Russia also won four of the 12 gold at the last European Championships in 2019. Russian Fencing Federation President Ilga Mamadov has accused some countries of attempting to change European Fencing Confederation statutes in a bid to remove his country. And finally on the program, Polish Army and Polish celebrities played a charity basketball game in Lodz, central Poland, to raise funds for Ukraine. All profits from the event, organized by former NBA player Mersin Gorta, will go to various NGOs and organizations supporting the Ukrainian military, such as the hospitals and a volunteer medical battalion. It was the ninth edition of the match between celebrities and soldiers, organized by Gorta's foundation, MG13. This year, we decided that we are not only going to promote basketball and respect for the uniform, but we are also going to raise money for Ukraine, according to Gotad, adding that he hopes to collect up to 300,000 slotis. That's about $67,000. The audience included the U.S. Ambassador to Poland, Marek Brzezinski, Ukrainian Ambassador to Poland, Vasil Zavaric, and a group of Ukrainian refugees and veterans. Among them, Colonel Ole Avromenko, Ukrainian army officer wounded in Mariupol in the early days of the war, who said attending the match was more of a psychological relief to him. Because of the situation right now, uh, Ukraine is in war uh, with Russia, uh, and we decided that you know not only we're going to promote basketball and also the respect for the for the uniform, but we're also going to raise money for uh, for Ukraine. So everything we're going to do uh, during this event, all the money we're going to raise and collect, we're going to uh, give it back to the community of Ukraine. You know, in NBA, you it's more obviously business. In NBA, it's all about business. You got to win games because you want to win championship. Right here, you want to have a good game but the winning game is is kind of like the third or the fourth most important option you know the most important option is to have fun during the game welcome relief uh, from all the stress and trauma of war that's our package this morning thanks for being with us uh, my name is Ladia Kirudin Riley uh, there'll be updates during the world today at uh, 5 p.m. That's later on in the day. But for now, do go out there and have yourselves a good day and a pleasant weekend ahead. Goodbye.